welcome to the Stranded Technologies podcast. I'm your host and founder of Infinita Fund, Nicholas Ansinger. In this show, we talk about how to accelerate the future. Our thesis is that many life improving technologies are held back by institutional barriers. How can we unblock vast opportunities while mitigating against the risks? What ethical principles, rules, and regulations can guide us on that path? We will discuss these questions with entrepreneurs, policymakers, and industry experts. If you enjoy the show, please give us five stars and visit us at infinitafund.com to join the community. Today is August the 15th, and my guest is Sandra Carrillo. Sandra is the professor in charge of cannabis research and education at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Panama. Sandra, welcome to the show. Thank you, Niklas. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for having me. And I am looking forward to having very interesting conversations since education is the key to destigmatize the use of cannabis as medicine. Fantastic. I'm very excited to have you on the show as well. What would you like listeners to know about you? I have a history uh, as a doctor. I used to be a very traditional doctor working in an emergency room. I graduated as a doctor and surgeon, and I worked for many years in emergency room, but I graduated already 25 years ago of medical school. But it wasn't until seven to eight years ago that I've heard about cannabis, cannabinoids and therapeutic applications. And I got very interested about this because I am a volunteer of a children's epilepsy foundation. We help these kids with different medicines. Back then, we weren't using cannabinoids, but the mothers of these children, they were flying to United States to get cannabis. And I was seeing how the kids with refractory epilepsies were getting better. But for me as a doctor, we always need to know more. We always need to see where the evidence is. And I started going to Canada, to United States, to Israel, to learn about the science backing up uh, these results. And I found a lot of evidence that complied me to keep studying. So I developed this interest in the cannabinoid therapies and it's been seven, eight years that I've been nonstop going all over the world, learning about the latest trends, what the doctors are doing, where is the research. I've been going to Europe, Canada, United States, Latin America. And when I considered that I was having some type of knowledge, I started doing education. I am co-creator of different certifications for doctors in Latin America. I created an alliance with a university in Colombia, one of the largest universities in Colombia, a diploma certification. It was the first diploma certifying doctors backed up by a university in Colombia, and we've been certifying more than 200 doctors. So education is booming. And in Latin America, I've been honorary professor of different universities in Mexico, in Peru, in Brazil teaching doctors and healthcare practitioners about therapeutic applications of cannabinoids. So education is a big part of my life and what I do and what I like to do. But I also have my clinical practice. I have medical cannabis clinics in Colombia. We have more than 1,500 patients and we have clinics in different cities in Colombia. I'm also vice president, co-founder of the Colombian Medical Cannabis Association. We are a group of doctors from different specialists gathering to promote education based in scientific evidence. So it's a lot of exciting things happening. And in Panama, I started advocating for legalization of medical cannabis for five years. And after five years to working with the Congress, finally, we got approval last year been working with the Ministry of Health on the regulation, And because I am professor of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Panama, I've been having the opportunity to lecture for students of medicine, nurses, doctors, specialists. So I see a big opportunity to educate doctors and healthcare practitioners because cannabinoid therapies, as you mentioned, it's not anything new. It's not that we're discovering anything. This is a millenary plant that has been using for thousands of years, even before Christ. So we are just taking what it was left because of the prohibition. We lost a lot of data, 
but I feel very excited to see how scientists and professionals and doctors from all over the world are researching and are publishing very interesting articles every day I read new research. So I think the future is brilliant if we use a responsible way. That's why I'm really excited to have you on because cannabis is a great example for what this podcast is about, a stranded technology that could help people. There's a demand for it, but it's held back by institutional barriers. It is recreational use is criminalized. Medical use is often prohibited. What's or how do you see the difference to be promoting medical use of cannabis versus recreational use? Do you see those as two different things? I'm okay with dividing it, but I have seen through all these years that some of the patients are self-medicating. And if you, first of all, never self-medicate with anything, because if you're talking about medication it needs to be prescribed by a doctor, monitorized, because doctors will know what are the side effects or the possible situations that a patient Uh, can have with drug interactions. But in the medical side, it's been hard but to put together protocols and to put together research. There is a lot of barriers for research in Latin America. We've been trying to do our best to promote research, but the truth is the governments don't promote CTs and the industry sometimes don't have the resources either. So it's us doctors, the ones who have to put our time and resources and try to find here and there how to create a reliable evidence. That is what I talk about, randomized controlled trials. That is what the scientific community and the doctors always asking for. The good thing is there is a lot of scientific evidence back there done by the different countries, the UK with GW Pharma and many other companies that they're doing research and universities, but we still need to be more free or less regulated in order to do research. More research we have, more evidence we have, so more patients will be having safe access to these treatments. In terms of regulations and policies, when you're talking, I've been advising different governments, and when you're going to talk about legalizing medical cannabis in a country, the first thing that you need to do is to talk to regulators, the politicians, the persons that they're going to make the law, and they need to know exactly what we're talking about because what I when I go to talk about this, the first thing that I find is the regulators and the government knows nothing about this. The only thing that they know is that the cannabis is bad, it's addictive, it's, it's a worse drug, and that's misinformation. And I don't blame them because this is what we have been hearing for hundreds of years, how bad and how horrible it is, and here it comes the stigma. So first, what I recommend is to talk to the regulators, the politicians, the government, and explain them what is the endocannabinoid system, why the plant of cannabis works in the endocannabinoid system, what is the evidence behind all these uses of cannabinoids in medicine. And then when the government understands, it's easier to create a regulation, a regulation, and this will just revert in benefits for the patients that are the they are ultimate goal is to help the patients in suffering. And regarding to recreational, I leave that to the discretion of each country because some of them they want to just re legalize a medical and adult use, like Canada and like Uruguay, Latin America. But I do think that the in my personal view is that medical cannabis markets should be mature enough in order to have other types of, of alternatives. Because sometimes when it goes straight to recreational, for doctors it's confusing and for patients it's confusing because they don't know where to go. If they should go to the dispensary or if they should go to the doctor. I think education, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the key because we can tell the patients how important it is to go to the doctor, to get properly prescribed and properly assessed because cannabis is not a panacea, is not a cure for every pathology. And there is a lot of false claims out there. I love the plant and I am in pro of using it, 
but with very specific applications. It's not for everything, and there is contraindications, in fact, and we're talking about medicinal cannabis, and if it's a medicine, we need to be responsible and aware, as if you're taking Tylenol, ibuprofen, you have to be aware also of interactions and side effects is medicine, but is the expertise of the doctor, the one that is going to keep the patient safe. And it's not that it's dangerous. It's just if it's properly prescribed, monitorized, and the patient is follow up, the results are beautiful for the patients. Can you talk a bit more why you're so passionate about cannabis, positive effects it could have on patients? And what do we know from studies? Where have we seen very good results already? I love to talk about evidence because we keep getting from the some doctors and some scientists saying, oh, there is not enough evidence. This is not evidence-based. And I'm used to teach doctors and specialists from different specialties, neurology, psychiatrists, oncologists. And the first thing that I show them when I'm lecturing in a class is the scientific evidence. So because that's the selling points, let's call it like that for a doctor. Because for me, and it happened to me when I saw the first uh, child with refractory epilepsy seizing 400 uh, times a day, and then they gave the, this little kid cannabidiol, I saw after uh, a few weeks the reduction of, on the seizures from 400 to 100 to 40. So you get curious, but it's not enough. When you see just the patient, you need to go to the science behind and then I realized that there was scientific evidence regarding to epilepsy. We have randomized placebo controlled trials that they've been done in the UK with very important numbers of patients, 250, 300 patients, multicentric studies, very well organized. The studies that for us doctors and scientists, that has validity. The refractory epilepsy is one of those pathologies that we have evidence that the use of cannabidiol it's very important to reducing the seizures. And even in the results of the studies, you can see more than 50% of reduction of the seizures in a patient. And this is a dramatic change for the patient and for the family. And this is what I always say, medical cannabis impacts not just the life of the patient, also the life of the social environment, the family, because a patient sees in 400 times a day is a mother who has to be 24 hours with the kid. But if you reduce 50% or even in some cases, not all the cases, they are seizure free. This is a mother that can put this kid in a special school. This is a mother that can go to work and bring an extra money to their house. And this is a mother who can take a pay attention to the other kids. So the impact in quality of life is what I see most with cannabinoid therapies. And also the other applications that we have very good scientific evidence is with spasticity in patients with multiple sclerosis. In these patients, not just the spasticity improves also the pain, the quality of sleep, because when you are in pain, you don't sleep well. So it's like a cycle and a constant that I see here is quality of life. Also, nausea and vomiting induced by chemotherapy, very good evidence as an adjunctive therapy with the anti-emetic therapies that they are already using in the protocols of chemotherapy patients. And the last but not the most important is chronic pain. Chronic pain is such a big word because it could be fibromyalgia, migraine, it could be arthritis, arthrosis, and neuropathic pain, oncologic pain. It's a very broad number of symptoms that we can help the patient to to treat. And this improves the quality of life because if you have less pain, you sleep better. If you are using less opioids, when the patients have oncology pathologies, opioids gives you side effects such as depression, constipation, and this makes the quality of life of a terminal patient really bad. So we're giving these patients a life with dignity. And I go to the other opposite, that is the patients in palliative care, terminal. We give these patients the opportunity to die also with dignity, because it's very different when you see a patient that is just with opioids. I'm also aware of that, and it's close to my heart, 
because my mom is a multiple sclerosis patient. So she has experienced the benefits of medical cannabis and many patients that she's in group with, that she sees, that she's in touch with are benefiting a lot from medical cannabis. Unfortunately, both my mom and I, knowing that from recreational use, have some kind of allergy, so we can't take it regularly. But we're a rare yeah. exception, it seems. We have side effects like sleepiness and digestive problems, but we know and she knows that it's helping many patients. Yeah. We should mm -hmm. do we should do a genetic testing for your mother to see if she has some polymorphisms or something that will guide us better what type of cannabinoids she should use, which ones no, what are the dosing. These are our important tools that that is good that the physicians consider and the patients do to be able to understand how the patients metabolize C B D THC. What is the state of the art when it comes to legalization of medical cannabis in the world? Like where is it allowed? Where is it not allowed? And specifically in Latin America? In Latin America is very interesting. Each country has a different regulation. Some of them are similar. But for example, in Colombia, doctors, we can prescribe medical cannabis. I feel very fortunate because we have already a product that is coming from a lab with BPE that is a certification that they grant to these laboratories for non-pharmaceuticals. So that means that the doctor, we have to prescribe, we write the prescription and we put milligrams of CBD, milligrams of THC, and what vehicle could be. It's just like a very artisan way to make it, but we write it in the prescription, the prescription goes to a lab, they prepare it in the lab, and three to seven days later, the product goes to the pharmacy for the patient. It's a little bit, it takes time because sometimes the patient needs the medication right away, and to have to tell them that they have to wait seven days is a lot, but for now, it's what we have. I hope that in the future, we can have in the pharmacies the product ready that the patient come with the prescription to the pharmacy and immediately the same day that it goes with the prescription, he can walk with the prescription in the hand because pharmacies cannot have the products in bulk to sell to every patient that is coming. They have to be prepared in the lab. And the idea of this is one single preparation for one single patient for one single pathology. It's like super personalized medicine. But um, as I say, I'm grateful because I see one is uh, Colombia is one of those uh, little co uh, countries that it has at least a regulated medication for the patients. But I think we have to move forward to something more efficient. The model of uh, Farmacia Magistral is good, but I think we have to move forward so for something that is more accessible for the patient and easier to prescribe. So that's Colombia. But there is other countries like Brazil, that in Brazil, they cannot cultivate. They just have to order from other countries and prepare the prescription. And the prescription takes time and they import the medication until it gets to the patient. So it's not too easy. It's not too easy, but we will, we are developing systems and countries like in Ecuador and Peru. It's almost similar, but with some subtle differences. I do think Latin America is leading in this way because it's every country of Latin America, with the exception of Bolivia, Venezuela, that they are countries that didn't legalize medical cannabis. Patients can have some sort of access to medical cannabis, but it's not yet perfect. Perfection doesn't exist, but we're looking for better and better alternatives for the patient. And the only thing that it really worries me more, and I see every day in my clinical practice, is that the patients have to pay out of their pockets for this medicine. And it's expensive for them. Colombia is the it's a, a, the majority of the people it, it don't have a lot of income. So for a person who makes a minimum salary of 700,000 pesos to have to pay 300,000 pesos a month, that is a lot, more than one third of the salary, it's a lot. So I've been advocating in the government to be if there is, we can implement some type of coverage for patients. So as a doctor, I have 
different missions. My one mission is education, second mission is research, and my third mission that is the one who drives me to do education and research is to guarantee safe access to the medicines for the patients. Which country in the world do you think is the best when it comes to the regulations on medical cannabis? Yeah, I like that question a lot because I always see Germany. I like Germany because they have pretty organized a system. The government is reimbursing to the patients. Of course, it's still far from perfect. I never expect perfection, but we can try to do the best. But for me, I see Germany as like a model to follow more for the reimbursement because I see, I see how important is the economic part. And it breaks my heart in my clinical practice when a patient comes For the first month, they pay the medication, they pay the consultation, and they come a l month later very happy telling me, doctor, I can't sleep better, I don't have the anxiety, my pain is going down, I, my life is better, I'm eating better. And the next month, they come again and they pay the consultation. And the third month, they came and say, I'm so sad, doctor, I cannot keep paying this medication. It's very, it's, it's very expensive for me. I, I'm going to have to go back to the medicines that the government covers. And it's so sad because you see a patient getting better with less side effects, improving, and then they have to go back again to the other treatments. So I think this is just the beginning. I have meetings with insurance, with the government, with the Ministry of Health, with the regulators of medications, with the industry, trying to see how can we benefit patients from this? Because if this cannot be a medicine just for rich people, a, a medicine should Uh, be available for everybody. I agree. At the same time, I'm also a bit worried or generally a problem with many new innovations is when regulators or governments don't allow them or prohibit them, then it's harder to innovate. It's more costly to deal with the legal side. It's more costly to pay lawyers. It's harder to find uh, collaborators and partners that work with you. So it's harder and more expensive to build new products. And it also means you have less evidence about the benefits. That is a problem in many of these areas of innovation where um, the government kind of has a preventative approach. So they're saying we make regulations so bad things aren't happening. And people often see this as the only way to regulate things. But a different way would be to say, hey, you can do it, but you need to follow rules when it comes to informed consent. And you are liable, maybe even personally, if you committed fraud or if misinformed consent wasn't there or the patient and the patient wasn't sufficiently informed about the risks. So my wish list number one would be that governments had a more default yes approach that is holding people liable for damages they cause instead of this preventative approach, because it just means everything takes years, sometimes decades to convince governments, policymakers, insurances to allow this. But if we would do it faster, we'd already be able to productize medical cannabis more. We'd have more knowledge what exactly is working for this patient and that patient. So maybe we could even sell some of these medical cannabis in some forms over the counter because we have so much data or tests. So do you see any of that? Do you see any of that happening that we could live in a future where we could buy some of these treatments and, and drugs over the counter even instead of having to go to a doctor where, or have an insurance pay for it? That's a tough question for me being a doctor <laughs> because you know, it is our, the cannabis plant is a very noble and forgiving plant. But being responsible, and my biggest concern is that I see this bill and the trend that the, everything that is coming from hemp, you, it can be sold everywhere over the counter. In certain matter, I think it's good for the business perspective, but we have to remain cognizant that the CBD particularly is one of the cannabinoids that has more interactions with receptors in our body, interacts with the TRBP, with the PFARs, with the 5-HET, the serotonin, with the uh, ion uh, channels. Uh, it has a, a, a massive amount of interactions in our body. And it's because of this, and it's meta metabolized by the cytochrome P45, 
B450. And it's because of this that there is susceptible to have a lot of drug interactions. I sometimes I'm concerned with somebody. The other day I had a friend calling me and saying, oh, I have my son that is getting very restless and I am going to give him these CBD gummies because I want him to leave me alone and I want to be able to relax. And I'm like, no, that's not a criteria for prescribing CBD. Oh, but I bought the gummies online and they look nice and they're delicious. And I'm an advocate to legalize medical cannabis, but I will not want to see medical cannabis trivialized. And why is that? Because in one of these cases, Maybe if if this mother gave five milligrams of CBD to the kid, nothing happens. But maybe the kid saw the jar and thought it was gummies and ate, I don't know, 500. Uh, The good thing is there is no lethal report of anybody dying for consumption of cannabis. But you can have side effects. And if it's a child, let's say, that is taking clobazam or valproic acid, we know that there is interactions between CBD and clobazam and then with valproic acid, the liver enzymes can be affected. It doesn't mean that you cannot use clobazam and CBD, but the doctor is the only one who will know how much clobazam, how much CBD in order to achieve a good result with minor side effects. So in this case, to sell it over the counter, I think the milligrams of this type of over the counter should be restricted. They shouldn't be like a very big amount because I have also a lot of patients that they're taking benzodiazepines and utilize benzodiazepines with cannabinoids also has a potentiation of the side effects or the cannabis or the benzodiazepines. So the alaker person, a patient, really don't know that. So that's what I consider that it's important that the doctor is in the picture or there is a lot of education telling the patients, if you're taking medications, you shouldn't be doing this amount of doses. So it's my only concern because something so beautiful as cannabinoid therapies can turn into something that people don't like because maybe they took the wrong doses at the wrong time for the wrong pathology. And simply you go and ask that person and say, oh, you used the medical cannabis? And they said, yes, I did, but it was useless. It, it, it didn't work for me. But that's not enough because maybe that patient didn't go to a doctor, didn't go, went to the proper titration period, didn't use the proper profile or chemo bar and he wasn't follow up. So many things that for just one word, one person said it didn't work or the opposite. The other patient that say, oh, I had a panic attack. I had a horrible reaction because they are self-medication or buying over the counter. So in here, I think the doctor should be in the picture because for the safety of the patients. And that's my humble point of view. I agree. What I would point out, though, is that even with a doctor in the picture and with approved drugs and therapies, you can even have widespread use of very bad drugs and therapies, right? Witness antidepressants, opioids, or even kind of the vilification of fat in food. So these are all things that are on the mainstream legal guardrails recommended by doctors. But at the same time, they are bad for people. Yeah. (laughs) I agree that Working with a doctor, working with education and figuring out what's best for you is always a better way to go. What I'm just arguing against is that categorical, if if it's not allowed by the FDA or by government health authorities, then you're not allowed to prescribe it as a doctor. You're not allowed to take it as a patient. There are cases where you consult with your doctor and they tell you it would be better for you if you do this, right? Or work out or whatever. But in the end, it's your body. It's your decision, right? Yeah, that's true. But yeah, what do you see? How, what do you see as the biggest challenges in Latin America specifically for broader use of medical cannabis? The first challenge that I see is the economic challenge, because if we get, we get able to make the government to include cannabinoids into the healthcare programs, this will solve. And when I I do advisor for governments, the first thing that I tell them is, look, most of the patients or the population that use more medication are all the elders, right? And when you come with an old person comes to my office, they're coming with around four to six medications that they're taking. And those medications is 
one for the blood pressure, another for diabetes, I know another for falling asleep, another for anxiety, another for appetite, another for pain. And if you compute all those five, the, the ones for pain can be replaced by cannabinoids. So for the governments, I always tell them, look at the savings that you will have when you are using cannabinoids instead of these other three or four medications. Of course, the diabetic medication, the insulin, you cannot replace it for cannabinoids. The high blood pressure medications, you cannot do it either. And there is the heart medication. There's other medications that they will be there and they are needed. But there are others that they are causing more harm. Patients are taking ibuprofen, so they have uh, ulcers in the stomach or they have kidney problems. So we have to give that patient that we give ibuprofen something for the gastritis. So we're adding more and more medications into a patient that just with medical cannabis should reduce that load of medications every day. And this will be reflected in the expenses of the government. So I think we, we have to start to, to have this broad, broader uh, view of, of the economics, of the prevention, of the treating pathologies in order to understand how beneficial it is to implement cannabinoid therapies in the clinical practice and how governments should be covering the, this medicine because it is a medicine. So I don't know why this discrimination of this no and this yes. So I, I think we are going to get there little by little. We are just scratching the surface. I have eight years in this, but I see that there's always more things to do. It's good that there is people like you, that they are willing to put the effort to educate and to move forward with new technologies and with new treatments. The only thing I'm doing is giving you a little platform. You are fighting the fight on the front lines, and I'm very grateful that you do that. Thank you. I'm. What do you see as opportunities for entrepreneurs and business in the field of medical cannabis? What is needed? What should entrepreneurs work on? The, I call it, the, and everybody calls it, the ancillary business. And there is so much things to do from... Even when you start planting the seed, do you need systems for infusion of for watering, lights for keeping the lights, uh, when it's greenhouses, all what involves in getting the infrastructures and marketing, testing, all the companies that do laboratory, third-party lab testing, of course, the creation of different types of products with different types of technologies. I am actually working since 2019 with Professor Will from Harvard University. He was doing research with treating, he started with preclinical in treating pancreatic cancer, and they developed a technology that is nano drones, micro tiny drones technology, and they were loading these tiny drones with a flavonoid derivative from the plant of cannabis, and they targeted the tumor, and they found, they, they finished already the clinical, preclinical trials, and they saw the reduction of the pancreatic cancer and the reduction on the metastasis. This was at Harvard University. I was there with the team, and now I am part of the Global Health Catalyst. A branch of the Global Health Catalyst is the International Phytomedicines Institute, that these are initiatives that were coming from Harvard and another Ivy Leagues are joined, like John Hopkins, Pennsylvania University. And what we are going to start doing is multicentric clinical trials. The, our first clinical trial, multicentric, will be with this flavonoid provided with the plant of cannabis targeted uh, to a tumor with this nanotechnology. So as I said, there is a lot of very cool things that I can be done. Then we're going to go to studies for chronic pain and also with some NFL players that they are very interested in funding research in concussion. Sky is the limit. And this is so exciting because there is a lot of things to do. And uh, research is also one of my passions among with education. So I think the projections are really good. We just need the governments to let us work more freely because there is a lot of regulations for everything. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, are there 
Patients' Rights and Advocacy Groups in Latin America. Yes, yes. Because mm. I think yes, that would yes. also be a good way forward because if you're a patient that is suffering from a disease where there's very good evidence that medical cannabis or any other kind of drug could help you, and if you band together, that is a very strong signal you give because you're showing people you're suffering and you're presenting evidence that it could reduce it. And if for many people, it's obvious, like, why do you not let people that really hope this can help them be allowed to take it, right? <laughs> Anything else what pe that people can do to help you on your mission to legalize and increase the market for medical cannabis? Just promote the lectures, the education, advocate for the plant. Sometimes people feel shy about talking about medical cannabis, and it happens to me at the beginning. When I was talking, all my family and everybody was like, oh, my God, why are you talking about that? It says, marijuana, are you giving that to? And I'm like, and I actually believe it or not, the first thing that I did it was like six, seven years ago, I put all my family, because I have a family, my family from my father's side are all doctors, surgeons, auto, all the specialties. So they were like very curious, but not comfortable. So I put together like a family reunion and I gave them the lecture about endocannabinoid system evidence, how this works. And they were like, oh my God, that's real. So yes, I, for me, education is opening the doors And because the education that I always go up front is based in evidence. I always show papers, publications from the medical journals, the most prestigious, well-done medical trials, meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and also explain them how the endocannabinoid system works because we didn't know about the endocannabinoid system when I started medicine. So I am trying to push in the new generations and talk to the faculties of medicine about the endocannabinoid system. We don't need to have the students of medicine to prescribe right now cannabinoids, but they need to know that the endocannabinoid system is one of the most important systems in our body because it's in charge of the balance of the homeostasis. So this is basic physiology that every single student should know, and I'm working on that working on that, trying to see how they can add it in the curricula of the students of medicine, for nurses, in veterinarian school, schools, because the endocannabinoid system, we have it all the animals, vertebrates, mammals, the only one that they don't have in the animal kingdom is insects. So we should all know about this. And it's complicated to talk about this. I was giving a lecture about the endocannabinoid system, and after I fi finish it, a neurologist approached me and he said, this is very complicated. <laughs> and I am, for the first time when I learned what was that, I was blown away. I couldn't understand so many things. And then after the repetition and the studying and this and that, it looks easier for me, but it's a very complicated system, but it's beautiful for everything it does. I lecture all over the world. I've been lecturing for Thailand, Africa, South Africa, Malta. Portugal, UK, all the love, Israel. So I am like I'm a citizen of the world. But this, I feel very lucky because this traveling all over the world is uh, allowed me to have a very broad perspective of what medicine is in different countries, what the doctors know about cannabinoid therapies. And there is people more advanced than us in this. And that is very important because we can learn from each other. And it's a beautiful group of people dedicated to study the plant, to promote the safe use, and to promote education and research. I don't see it going anywhere. And it's going to be a very important part of the clinical practice of each doctor. Because the patients are coming to you to ask you, I want medical cannabis. This is a phenomenon that I've never seen with other medicines. I never saw a patient come and say, oh, I need an hypertensive. Oh, I need an anti-diabetic. No, it was the doctor, the one who tells. With medical cannabis, is the patient who's coming because he's saying, I've been trying this and this and it doesn't work. And I read the medical cannabis can help me. But you have to be honest with the patient and say, let's see, let's do the clinical records, let you, because... Is not for everybody, but 
it's a beautiful medicine and we have to be responsible in the way we talk about it and the way we prescribe it because our main goal is primum non first do not harm and the patients are our first priority it was an interesting insight that the progress is often driven by patients asking for medical cannabis from doctors so i think that can also be a good strategy for communication for marketing for education also for entrepreneurs to create change and i'm very glad sandra that you're fighting this fight that you gave us this insight into how fighting to unblock what I call a stranded technology looks and how complex it is, how many people you have to convince. So we have scientific evidence. We could get even more. We know the benefits, but it's held back because of a lack of education, because of the way the political system works. And it needs people like you. It needs entrepreneurs in education, in business, in science, in policy to make this change happen. This is also the reason why I'm inviting my listeners to a conference also in Central America, in Honduras, on the beautiful island of Roatan on September 23 to 25, called the Prospera Health Tech Summit 2022, where I invite policymakers, entrepreneurs, and innovators and other change makers to develop strategies to create and change and build the healthcare system of the future in Central and Latin America and beyond. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Sandra, for coming on the show. Thank you, Nicholas, for having me. Looking forward to seeing you soon.